All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to SQL Server High Availability and Disaster Recovery. Uh, my name is Denny Cherry. I'm the owner and principal consultant for Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting, uh, based out of California. So short flight to get here. Uh, standard disclaimer here. Uh, could be anything new theoretically that we talk about. Uh, that's not, probably not going to happen since I don't actually work for VMware. Um, <laughs> I am a Microsoft MVP for the SQL Server product. I am also a Microsoft Certified Master for both SQL Server 2008 and 2012. Apparently, I need to upgrade, update my logo. Uh, my contact info is here. Uh, it'll also be at the end of the, end of the presentation as well. Sorry, I literally had to run over here. One of my customers is actually in the middle of a production down problem at the moment. <laughs> so I got them to a point where they will survive so I can come talk to you fine folks real fast. <laughs> and then I'll go back to troubleshooting their production problem after the session. Um, so here is what we're going to talk about over the next hour or four, 58 minutes. Otherwise, the nice lady will, will uh, yell at me if I go over. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, always on failover clustering. So that's going to be kind of the traditional failover clustering that we've had in the SQL Server product for a good long time. We're going to talk about always on availability groups. That's a new feature in SQL Server introduced in SQL Server 2012. It's a little easier to use. It's a little cooler. It's got some limitations around it. And then since we have a brand new version of SQL Server coming out, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about what are the options in SQL Server 2016 that you, you and your DBAs can use as you move forward with the new version of the product. Um, so I always do a survey at the beginning. This is how you can get your exercise for the day, other than running around this entire com uh, convention. So, and hopefully you guys know the answer to these questions. Who is running 2016, or your, your DBAs are looking at SQL Server 2016 so far? A couple, okay, cool. SQL Server 2014. Okay, I'm impressed, about half the room. 2012, a little bit more. 2008 R2, it should be like everybody at this point. 2008. 2005, 2000, okay, this is starting to get older than some of your kids, SQL 7, <laughs> nobody for SQL 7, okay, you guys are doing, oh, one person, SQL 6, 5, <laughs> so if you're not aware, SQL 7 came out in 1996, give or take, SQL Server 6.5, earlier than that, apparently he's a brave soul, still running SQL Server 7 in production. Um, that's sadly not unusual. Um, you guys are lucky as VMware administrators. You get to upgrade relatively fast to the new versions. Um, based on that show of hands, obviously you've probably noticed a lot of people are running old versions of databases. This is normal. A lot of our customers are actually running SQL 2000 or SQL 2005 um, in production today. Uh, the system that I'm actually working on right now, um, it was actually SQL Server 2008 R2 as of Friday. Um, so we just upgraded it to SQL Server 2014, and now we're having some weird problems that we have to deal with. But that's not here nor there. So let's talk about ooh, high availability. So first option is what we call traditional failover clustering. So this is kind of our normal failover clusters that we've always built in the SQL Server world, or we have since SQL Server 7, SQL 2000 back in the day. This gives us a good level of high availability, relatively straightforward to configure. On, we build these on top of Windows failover clustering. Now, we build these inside of VMs, and people do this all the time. So the reason we deal with things like failover clustering and always-on availability groups inside a virtual machine is because we need extra layers of, of high availability. We need more high availability than the host platform is going to give us. Um, and it doesn't matter what host platform that is, Hyper-V or VMware. The reason we need that is because at the database level, if those databases go down, if those instances of SQL Server go offline, the application is down. While it's fine that a lot of servers are okay with a few minutes of restart while we wait for a host to reboot, or if a host fails while we wait for the system to bring all those VMs up in the rest of our farm, in the SQL Server world, we probably need those applications back up faster. We have very, very strict HA requirements we have to maintain, and we don't have the option of running an instance on two servers at the same time. So we have to find a way to get that availability. So this is why we a lot of times build these failover clusters inside of VMs, inside the virtual machines, to get that extra layer of protection. Also, if a VM reboots, maybe it blue screens, maybe we need to patch it, we need that extra layer of HA at the SQL Server level to keep things up and running. 
Now, with failover clustering, we have a single set of database files. So we have some sort of shared storage sitting underneath this environment that's presenting storage to both our VMs, much like you would configure with an ESX cluster, with a vSphere cluster, where you have one set of LUNs presented to all the machines, and they all just point to it. In the case of the Windows world, if you've never set up a failover cluster before, you're going to be using you know, an active-passive configuration. So only one of those machines will actually own the disks at any one time. And the machines will coordinate that themselves within the Windows VMs. Now, what we do at that point is actually then just install SQL Server, but we install it on multiple machines. When we install that first, first node of the cluster is what we call it, when we install that first VM, and we tell it, hey, install SQL Server, put the data files out on this shared storage. When we install that second VM, we simply tell it, hey, go look at this other set of disks that we promise will be available to you when it's your turn to run this instance. So when failover happens, the ownership of those disks simply moves from one side to the other. So there's a few ways you can present this storage. Everybody's favorite is an option, RDMs. I know you guys all love managing lots of RDMs. Um, another option is to use iSCSI. You can have the Windows servers connect to your storage platform using iSCSI if that's an option to you, and that will work just fine in a lot of cases. There's a third option that is available, and that's to use a filter driver on the Windows VMs to do the clustering at the Windows guest level, or do that, share, that storage sharing at the Windows guest level. You simply prevent, present normal VMDKs to your two VMs, or more VMs, depending on how many you have, and you use products like SIOS Data Keeper to actually replicate the storage inside the Windows VMs between each other. That way, the, sh the storage looks like shared storage to Windows. From a VM perspective, it's just VMDKs. Both servers have their own set of VMDKs. And then SQL Server can then do whatever failover clustering it needs to do. So when we have this shared storage, even though SQL Server is installed on multiple VMs, only one of those VMs is actually going to be talking to those database files at any time. So I've got a pretty little picture here for you. Uh, so here we have two nodes. I will not use this laser pointer. I will use the virtual laser pointer. So we've got two nodes. We've got node A. And then we've got node B. So node A is what we call our active node. Node B would be our passive node in this configuration right now. So underneath it, we've got some sort of shared storage. Uh, this could be SANS, could be a network share. Again, it's protected by SIOS Data Keeper. Um, if you're really brave and you want to have some fun, you can play with the CSS, the cluster shared storage in Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2 and use that to pre present your shared storage inside of the VMs so that you can actually let Windows do that replication inside the VM. So if we were to look at these two VMs as actual machines, uh, we would see the SQL Server service running on one and, and stopped on the other. In the event of a failover, either something that we trigger or a VM reboots, simply the, the service just stops on that machine and restarts on the other box, comes online, and then starts running, accesses those data files and starts using things. And it works fairly straightforward. That failover time is about five to 10 seconds. That's how long it's gonna take for that database to move over. Now that will change depending on how many hard drives you have. The more hard drives you have presented to your VMs, the longer it's gonna take for all these things to fail over, just because it takes Windows a while to deal with all these hard drives that it has to move across. Now we can scale these out relatively wide. Um, I don't see too many people going over kind of a four to six to eight node configuration with you know, N minus one instances installed, but you can go relatively wide, and this helps keep the CFO happy. We want to, you know, this lets us get a fairly good amount of hardware utilization here. In this configuration, we've got 50% hardware utilization because we're only using one VM at any one time. If we go this direction, now we've got four machines all running, three of them running SQL Server instances all at the same time, one node passive. So we've got one node sitting there doing nothing. 25% of our systems, of our VMs not being utilized. Not great, but not bad. And we can scale that out basically as wide as we want as long as we're using SQL Server Enterprise Edition. Uh, I believe today the limitations are simply based on how many, VM, or how many machines your Windows OS supports in the cluster.
which for Windows 2012 R2, I believe, is 64 nodes. So you could do maybe 62 instances in one big, giant cluster, should you need to. When installing an instance, or when, when setting up a failover cluster, each of these instances is going to be installed and managed as kind of its own separate container. Um, this means getting these up and running can take a while on these wide clusters. Figure it's about an hour to install SQL Server for each SQL Server install you have to do. If you've got a four node cluster with three SQL Server instances on it, you're talking 12 installs, that's a good day and a half of work. Just to get that installed, that doesn't account for patching. So that's because each instance has to be installed on every potential node that could run it. So we, we end up running SQL Server a lot. Thankfully, there is a lot of automation we can use to help speed this process up. Uh, every time we do a SQL Server install, we actually get a config file put on that server's hard drive, so we can actually take that config file and use it to, re to build all the rest of our installs. So we only actually have to go through the GUI once. When you're building failover clusters, each instance is going to require its own network name and IP address. Now, this is a requirement of the failover clustering service, which is sitting underneath of the SQL Server instance. The reason each instance has to have its own network name and IP address is because each instance is going to fall into its own resource group or its own container within failover clustering. Those containers are independent, so we have to be able to access each one independently. Now that's the downside. The upside is, even though we have to have separate instance names for each one of these machines, we can actually access all of them as if they were just the server name. If you simply configure all the instances to listen on the default port, which is port 1433, then all these machines will simply just act, be accessible as if they were just a standalone box. There's no special network names we have to use to get to them. We obviously have to have at least one hard drive set up on our environment, set up for each instance. So if you're doing local drives inside SQL Server, or you're or sorry, inside the Windows VMs, where you're presenting storage to the servers, um, that basically limits you to 25 instances that you can cluster on one environment. The reason being, you can only have 25 drive letters. We only have 26 letters in the English alphabet, and C drive is already taken. And you can't put an instance on there. When we're talking about failover clustering, we kind of need to redefine how we think about an instance in SQL Server. When we're just doing standalone boxes, each server is its own instance. We may have multiple instances on there, but it's just this one construct sitting inside of this one VM. When we start dealing with clusters, though, we need to rethink that instance, because that instance is now going to be configured in multiple places, and it's just a matter of which server is actually running it at this one specific time. So each clustered instance is going to have the same name, and they're all going to share that network name and IP address. It's just a matter of who's running it as to where it's going to live and which physical piece of hardware it's going to be running on, or which VM it's going to be running on. When we're building our failover clusters, we have to set up dependencies between these resources. Now, SQL Server is going to do a lot of this for you, but it's still good to know how all this has to get set up inside the Windows world because if you need to change this hardware configuration, maybe you need to present new hard drives, you need to be able to go into failover clustering and tell it, hey, here's this new hard drive you're dependent on. The reason being, these dependencies are the order of things that happen. So when I start up my failover cluster and I tell SQL Server to start, it's got to start a bunch of stuff before SQL can actually start. So it actually, we start at the bottom of this, of this diagram, and it starts by firing up all the hard drives and the IP address and making sure that it can grab hold of that IP address and those drives correctly. Once the IP address is online, then it grabs the instance name and brings that online. When it brings that online, it registers it in DNS, makes sure that everything is working correctly when talking to Active Directory, and then at that point, the SQL Server service is able to start. Once that starts, then the SQL Server agent, which is the job scheduler, and the, the alerting component within SQL Server is then able to start. Assuming that all works correctly, the applications can then connect. So if we add a new hard drive to this configuration, we need to tell SQL Server, hey, you need to be able to start up and what order this happens. We need to tell it, hey, you need to wait for this hard drive to start. We have to do that for two reasons. One, if SQL Server tries to access data files on a hard drive that, aren't, that isn't there, SQL Server is not going to be very happy because obviously it needs access to its files. 
The other reason, if you try to create a database on a local hard drive that is not referenced in your failover dependencies here, then SQL Server is not going to be able to actually create a database on that hard drive, and it'll actually throw a failure, as fa failure error message when you try to create that hard drive, or when you try to create that database. So as we've been moving through the various versions of SQL Server, we've actually gotten a lot of enhancements that have been built into the product. So we started with clustering back in the SQL 2000 days, and it basically didn't change much until SQL Server 2012. With SQL Server 2012, we started to actually get some features that are important to the networking team. Basically, they made the networking team no longer want to beat the DBAs with a stick when you wanted to do HA or DR. That first feature was the multi-subnet failover support. What this allowed us to do is build geographically redundant SQL servers. So one SQL server in New York, the other one in Los Angeles, for example and actually do it without having to have the same IP subnet or the same VLAN in both sites. This was obviously a very big deal because building stretch VLANs is incredibly difficult, or so I'm told. I've never had to do it myself, thankfully. The other nice feature we got was the ability to no longer have to actually present shared storage to the server. If we wanted to, we could actually use network shared network storage. So we could use a network share off on another server or on a network appliance of some sort. Now, if you're going to use the network storage support feature of SQL Server 2012 and above, you're going to want to make sure you're using SMB3 as your networking protocol or your SMB protocol between those servers. So basically, you want to use Windows 2012 and above on both sides. Anything older than that, and you're not going to have the throughput performance that you need to get good performance out of your SQL Server database. Um, the slowest component of any database server is storage. So we need to do everything we can to make sure that we've got the performance we need. Uh, is anybody running core mode for any of, their, any of their Windows VMs? A few brave souls are using Windows without a GUI. Excellent. Um, as of SQL Server 2012, we actually support installing failover clustering on core mode. So we can actually support those core mode installs now, giving you that nice, slim Windows operating system. Um, it's really cool, especially when you watch a new sysadmin sys RDP to a core mode install for the first time. If you've never done it, give it a shot somewhere. Um, you're greeted with a command prompt. And that's pretty much it. Um, there's no start menu. There's nothing. Um, so it's very entertaining to watch new people try to, try to figure those out for the first time. So the other thing we got, this is more applies to physical SQL servers than virtual ones, uh, is the ability to put tempdb on, on a local drive. Uh, so this is really handy for SQL server installs that are clustered in the physical world that need super high-speed storage for their tempdb database. So the tempdb database is used for, it's kind of like a scratch space. It's kind of like a, sort of like the Windows page file. Um, and up until now, we've always had to put it on shared storage. So we've had to put it on fairly expensive high-speed SAN storage. So now we can actually put it on local disk and take away the requirements to replicate that and do all the normal SAN management sort of things with that local disk. So when we're setting up the multi-subnet failure, uh, basically what we're doing is setting up two different IP addresses for that same SQL Server instance to listen on. They only come on one at a time, depending on which site you're actually on. When SQL Server 2012 was released, Microsoft actually put out a new driver for SQL Server for applications to use to connect that actually takes advantage of this specific feature to allow even faster failover. Basically, what happens when you're using this multi-subnet feature is when SQL Server starts up, it goes to DNS and registers both possible IP addresses. So we tell it, hey, you're going to use 192.168.1.5 and 192.168.2.5, depending on which site you're running in. It registers both of those IP addresses in DNS. So then whenever clients go to connect, they get both of those IP addresses back. What happens then is the client, when it tries to connect, it just goes to connect to both IP addresses. One of them will respond. One of them won't. Whichever one responds, it uses. The other one, it simply disconnects. So that's how that feature works. It actually cuts failover time down from potentially hours to seconds when doing a DR failover. The reason for that is because when you fail over to your DR environment, you now have to wait for DNS replication in Active Directory to replicate that IP address change out across the rest of your environment. 
So now we already have both of those IP addresses in there. So whichever one is working, that's the one that people connect to. So as soon as SQL Server fails over and comes up, users can connect. They don't have to wait for any, any sort of AD replication to happen. Depending on where your users are and how your Active Directory is configured, that could take either minutes or hours, depending on you know, how, big your, how big your organization is. So I mentioned this earlier, the, cl the cluster shared volume support, or cluster shared, or the CSS. So CSS was introduced in SQL Server 2012 as the new feature. This is kind of the big new feature in failover clustering for 2012. So this was introduced with Windows 2012 R2, uh, and Windows 10 Server, or Windows 16, or 2016, or whatever it's being called, uh, does require SMB3 for, to make this work. Um, and it gives you the ability to have more of this clustered environment with just the local VMDKs without really having to do any of the really harder things in failover clustering. Now, if anybody's working in Azure, which I don't know if anybody here is or not, a few people are, okay. Um, so failover clustering is actually supported in Azure as well. So this becomes really interesting when you consider it as a DR target, because you can actually build a failover cluster on-prem and stretch it out to Azure uh, fairly easily. There are some requirements within Azure to make that work, which are listed up there, but it's fairly straightforward to get set up. So the big cool new feature in SQL Server 2012 was always on availability groups. So with always on availability groups, we've gotten a few new concepts built into this platform to get this thing set up. So there's a few new things for the DBAs to have to deal with, a few new terms to learn, a few new concepts to wrap our head around. Um, the, the biggest one being the fact that these availability, availability is now managed at the database level, or at a group of databases, really. So when we set up our always on availability groups, we build them around the concept of an application. So an application has four databases. We create an availability group. We put those four databases in it. We can then guarantee that all four of those databases will always reside on the same server at the same time within our configuration. Makes it a little easier to wrap our heads around, and it also gives us a little more flexibility within the environment. When we're setting up always on availability groups, we set them up kind of similar to we did in, what we did in database mirroring back in starting in SQL Server 2005. Um, but we do it, again, at the database level. So we stand up our instances, but this time they're not clustered instances. We stand up normal, standalone instances, tell them they're going to be members of an availability group. We have to put failover clustering underneath it, so we use that failover clustering only to detect failure. We're not actually using it for any sort of data movement or to do any restarting of stuff. All it does is detect a failure and tell SQL Server, hey, something failed, go restart it. That's all that the failover clustering is doing. Doesn't require any shared disk, so we can do this without any sort of cluster shared volumes. We can do this without any, anything like Cyrus Data Keeper. We can do this without RDMs. We can do this without iSCSI. We can do this all as VMDKs inside of, of vSphere. We create the databases in the environment, and we tell it, hey, go ahead and replicate these across machines. I want to copy the database here. I want another copy here and another copy here. So I conveniently changed the city names from the US cities to European cities. Um, so here we've got two, two nodes, node A and node B in London, and then we've got a third node, o node C, over in Amsterdam. So for the two databases that are inside the same physical data center or in the same city, we would configure them for synchronous failover or synchronous data movement. So we use two-phase commit so that as the data is written to the first node, it's immediately written to the second node as well. The user's transaction is not considered committed until both databases or both instances have a copy of that data. The third copy is an asynchronous data copy. So data will get there eventually. That's our DR site. So we can move data fairly quickly. Basically, we're limited by network bandwidth and network latency. As long as we got the bandwidth, we can move the data. As long as the latency is not too bad, the data will be up to date. Standard rules apply uh, as far as how far you can go with synchronous data movement. Same, same rules as your storage environment, for example. 100 kilometers is about as far as you're probably wanna, gonna, going to want to go with synchronous data movement. Anything further than that, you'll want to flip to asynchronous because you don't want that additional latency in, in your uh, database platform. So 
like I mentioned, this is very similar to the database mirroring feature that was introduced back in SQL Server 2005. What we're doing is we're sending a transaction log stream from one instance to another. So as commands come in, they're simply read from the transaction log and fed to the other side of the server or to the other node in the environment. All the data is encrypted. So if you needed to feed this data across the public internet, you would be able to do that safely because all the data is encrypted by default using standard 256-bit encryption as the default. You can adjust that as needed. If you're in an environment where you're not worried about the encryption, you can turn that off if you trust everybody in your environment. Uh, typically wouldn't recommend it, but it is an option. One of the really nice things about this is this gives us some scale out functionality. We can actually make our database application wider as well as giving it HA. So we can actually read off all those secondary copies. So this can be really handy for putting users in remote sites and giving them a local copy of the database and calling that DR and giving them a lo that local copy to run reports off of. So we can get a lot of functionality out of the system. Obviously, we have automatic failover, both in failover clustering or in always-on availability groups. Uh, with always-on availability groups, that automatic failover only happens when we're going to a synchronous copy. If we're going to an asynchronous copy, that failover is always going to be manual. So if you're using this for HA purposes, you're going to want at least one synchronous copy to failover to. So how big can you make these? How much redundancy in HA and DR can we get in these environments? With SQL Server 2012, we can have up to four secondaries, two of which can be synchronous, up to four of which can be asynchronous. So we can actually get a decent amount of HA just out of the box in the first version of this feature. So we can put three copies in production and two additional copies in DR. That gives us a decent amount of redundancy, so we should be able to keep that application online as much as possible. But if that's not good enough for you, in SQL Server 2014, Microsoft introduced a few additional replicas. We can still only have two synchronous, but we can have up to eight total replicas. So we could have up to, you know, if we had two synchronous, we could have six additional asynchronous copies. So now we're starting to get some serious flexibility in this environment and how we want to lay things out. Now, one of my big complaints about always on availability groups is that if you have two copies in DR, both of those copies have to have their own network traffic accounted for. You can't feed one of them and have it feed a second one. We're actually doing a project right now where we're running into this, this little bottleneck uh, because the production servers are in Amsterdam and the disaster recovery servers are in North America, in Philadelphia. So obviously that is a large network pipe that they have to have between those two sites. So the fact that they have to ha double their network traffic because they want two copies in DR is an issue for them, um, one that they're overcoming. What's going to happen in SQL Server 2016? Uh, I don't know. You'll have to ask Microsoft. Uh, they'll give us an answer whenever they decide to release the product. Um, we're shooting, we're assuming, you know, April-ish. Uh, Microsoft has a little habit for the last two releases of releasing versions on April 1st, which is a fun day for uh, big corporate announcements to go out. Hey, I don't work there. I can say whatever I want. So. How can we combine these? What if we need even more availability that we can get out of either one of these features separately? So we can actually combine always on availability groups and failover clustering and get even more redundancy out of the system. Why would we do this? Maybe we need more redundancy in each site. Uh, one of the use cases back in SQL Server 2012 was for a credit card processor and their management decreed that in the event of a server failure in any one site, they still had to have redundancy within that site. Well, to do that, and oh, the other requirement was they had to have three sites. So to do that, they would have to have nine copies of the data. That's not even available today. So what they ended up doing was building three failover clusters, one in each site with three nodes each, one instance on each cluster, and then used always on availability groups to actually replicate the databases between those three copies, between those three instances that then leverage kind of both of those technologies to give them the availability that, they, that management wanted and an easy way for the DBAs to actually manage this and keep all this data moving. Now this does change the way the automatic failover is going to work. So it does change how SQL Server is going to allow failover to happen. 
The reason being, Microsoft decided that you're only allowed to fail over at one level of the environment or another. So if you have always on availability groups by itself, the availability group is what fails over. If you have failover clustering, and then you build always on availability groups on top of that, the failover cluster will be your fa automatic failover component. The always on availability group will not. So big reason there, in the event that the failover cluster does fail over, we don't want the always on availability group to see that failure and then try to fail itself over on top of that. That could just end up to the application being down for longer. So obviously not a good position to be in. One of the big complaints with things like database mirroring that were introduced in older versions of SQL Server is the lack of support with other features inside SQL Server. Always on availability groups is supported with pretty much everything. Um, if you're using a feature inside the database, it's supported with always on availability groups. There, there's really nothing that's not supported. Um, this includes all the new security models. So those of you who are working in environments where you need you know, separation of duties and those sorts of features built into the platform, that all works. Transparent data encryption, so if you need to protect the data sitting within the SQL Server so that nobody can see it if they take a copy of the backup or if they take a copy of the data file, that's all fully supported as well. Um, the only kind of catches or the only kind of, you know, things with asterisks next to them is the new column store indexes in SQL Server 2014. Those sort of work. By sort of work, I mean they work fine on whatever server is primary, but you can't read off of them in, in SQL Server 2014. That all gets fixed when SQL Server 2016 comes out. That's already been announced that that's been fixed. The other thing that doesn't work quite as expected is SQL Server replication. So SQL Server replication is a beast that's been around forever. Uh, it involves three components, a publisher, a subscriber, and a distributor. The publisher is the server that is the primary copy of the data. The subscriber receives that data, sort of like a magazine subscription. And the distributor is what pushes out all that data from the publisher to the subscriber. It's the transport mechanism. The, public, the publisher and the subscriber, those are supported within always on, availability, always on availability groups with no problems. The distributor is not. So that would have to be hosted on a different instance that's not using always on availability groups. Those are your two kind of, hey, these don't quite work as we expect them to. Um, pretty much everything else works as expected. So like I mentioned, we can do hybrid availability groups between on-premise and some sort of cloud provider. Um, I've got Azure mentioned here, but you could easily do this with vCloud. You could do this with Azure. You could do this with Amazon. You could do this with Rackspace. You know, kind of insert your cloud provider here. As long as you can get a site-to-site -site between yourself and whoever your cloud provider is, site-to-site you know, -site VPN, this will work exactly as expected. So we've got our instances on-premise set up within always on availability groups, and we have simply another instance off on some cloud provider somewhere that we're simply replicating data to. The re big requirement here, obviously, network connectivity between the two, between on-prem and whatever cloud you're using for your DR site or where you're allowing users to run reports out of. The other big requirement, you have to have Active Directory stretched from one site to another. That's a failover clustering requirement, not a SQL Server requirement. Um, so once that Active Directory domain is set up in both sites, it's got to be the same Active Directory domain, unfortunately. Uh, then you can install that second instance, add it into your failover cluster, push and start pushing data to it, and it's fairly easy for you to get all set up. I'm going to skip all the Azure slides here. Um, obviously, cloud is cheap. We use cloud. Makes it nice and easy. Um, so yeah, here's pretty much how you set it up in Azure. Uh, so we've got two copies on-prem. We've got that third copy off on the network, or off in the cloud somewhere. We have the availability group stretched between the two. And then the big difference between doing this to two of your own sites and instead doing it to the cloud is you've just got to get that site-to-site -site gateway set up, site-to-site -site VPN of some sort set up. So in Azure, you can do that as a component of the Azure infrastructure. You can create a network gateway in the portal. If you're in Amazon, for example, you have to use a routing and remote access server. And they don't give you the ability yet to do any sort of site-to-site -site VPN within, uh, within that Azure environment. Or AWS environment. Yes, sir. 
Uh, so the question is, do you have to have a witness server to set up this sort of environment? Uh, so you don't have to have a witness like you did in database mirroring. Um, what you have to have is something to control quorum. Uh, so in the perfect world for a failover cluster, in the Windows fa failover clustering world, you would put a VM off in some other data center. Um, so I'm going to use Azure as my example here. So maybe on-premises is in Texas. My cloud data center is, say, US West. Maybe I'd go to US East and put a virtual machine out there and use that kind of as my quorum for my failover cluster so that it would then see which site is actually up and which site is actually down. Um, so that way we get that ability to detect failure relatively easily and, and have, that, have that happen. Um, so in, with database mirroring, you had to have a virtual machine sitting out there with SQL Server running on it to act as quorum. So you don't have to have that anymore. Um, it's all, all, all that failover detection is handled through failover clustering now, which is kind of nice. So why would we want to do this? Why would we want to potentially spin up passive nodes in some sort of cloud environment? Um, obviously, we need to protect ourselves for DR. Buying DR hardware, fairly expensive. Uh, renting VMs, fairly inexpensive. Makes uh, chief financial officers fairly happy when we can do things inexpensively, especially if we as administrators can still maintain them. The nice thing about, about a lot of these cloud providers is we can still do all the stuff we're used to doing without actually having to travel somewhere to rack hardware into a, into a data center. I was just building out a DR environment for one of my clients. They've decided that they need to present a DR proposal to their management. Uh, so their systems team wanted a colo in the Midwest, in the middle of the U.S. somewhere. Um, they're based out of Southern California, where I am. Uh, so they came up with some proposal of like $20,000 a month between renting hardware and renting licenses and all that good stuff. Uh, we actually priced out what it would cost to run things in Azure, because uh, they're a Microsoft customer. Uh, and it ended up being about $2,000 a month. Much, much less, ex less expensive. Because... In any of the cloud providers, you can start with really small VMs for DR. In the event that you go into a DR scenario, you can then make those VMs bigger. Just reboot them and make them bigger, and now we've got the, the horsepower to actually process our workload. We get some additional benefits by doing things like putting SQL Server and stretching it out to our DR platform. We can use those instances. We can actually get utilization of those pieces of equipment uh, by using always on availability groups so we can actually run reports off those secondaries. So we can get all that workload off of those production boxes because as much as we as DBAs hate it, I hate to admit it, almost every application has reports running off of the production server. We love getting that workload off the production server so that it doesn't impact the production application. Now we can do that and we can just have the reports run in the DR platform, in the DR environment, and then the users can still access those reports. We can also offload our backups to our secondary servers off of that DR platform. So taking SQL Server backups is obviously a very IO intensive operation, especially with large databases. If you've got a terabyte database and you're taking full backups of it every day, you are copying one terabyte of data every single day. That's probably impacting your production application during your business, you know, maybe or maybe not during your business hours. Wouldn't it be nice if we could offload that to DR where we don't care if we're impacting the, the, the storage. We can actually do that here. All the backups we take in the DR platform are exactly as if we took them in the production environment. There are those annoying little requirements of the same Windows domain and, and, you know, and uh, act, having access to Active Directory. If you're going to set this stuff up, do keep in mind you do need an Active Directory domain controller at whatever site these SQL Server instances are at. Um, otherwise, this whole thing comes crashing down as soon as your production site goes down. So what's coming? We have this new version coming out. So it should be out in five-ish months, is the assumption. We actually get a lot of new features in SQL Server 2016. Microsoft has put a very large investment into this to make HA even better in SQL Server. So we get database-level triggering of failures. We get support for distributed transactions. We get better automatic failover support. We get better trans log transport performance, so your data is going to move from site to site even faster than it does today. Uh, 
Um, I believe they're targeting a 30% performance increase over what they can do today. And what they can do today can support 95, 97% of workloads. We're getting load balancing of our readable secondaries. I've got a graphic that'll explain that in a little bit more. We're getting group managed service accounts to make password changes a thing of the past. He's nodding, he's apparently right about this. <laughs> so what are these things? So database level failover support, this is the ability for a database to go offline and trigger a failover. So today in SQL Server 2014 and below, if there's a problem at the instance level, if SQL Server has an issue, SQL Server crashes, failover happens. In SQL Server 2016, we're actually gonna be monitoring at the database level. So if a database becomes corrupt, it'll fail over automatically. So that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. We hope it's a good thing. <laughs> We'd obviously prefer our databases not become corrupt. It is an optional setting, so you'll have to turn it on so DBAs aren't gonna freak out when databases start failing over by themselves. But it does give us the ability to look for these databases to go offline and fail over. So it gives us a higher level of availability. Since right now I have to get a phone call that says, hey, the database is offline, what's wrong? And then I gotta go figure it out. In this case, it would simply fail over, bring itself back online, and start pushing data back to the other server if possible. If the database is completely screwed up, maybe the drive disappeared, then it won't push data across. So one of the biggest changes, and this is the thing that gets the most applause when I'm at Microsoft events, is the ability to use distributed transaction coordinator within always on availability groups. This has been the biggest stopping point for SQL Server implementations in always on availability groups. And the reason it's been the stopping point is DTC is used in most large applications. What it does is it controls uh, transactions between servers. So if I've got a web server that takes in a file from a user, opens a database transaction, starts doing changes to it, or starts making changes to the database, and then goes to write the file to the hard drive of the web server, and that write fails, I need all that to be rolled back as one atomic unit. That's how transactions work. Well, this, because they're on separate servers, we have to do a distributed transaction, because it is distributed across machines. Now we can support that. So that's gonna be fully supported in 2016. It technically works in 2014, but it's unsupported and Microsoft will help you if something goes wrong. It is gonna require an OS patch to work and it is gonna work on down level versions of Windows. So you're not gonna to need to worry about upgrading to new versions of Windows in your guest OSs to make this work correctly. So obviously we have lots of busy systems. That's why we need to maintain these things and keep them online. In SQL Server 2012 and 2014, we only supported failing over to a single VM or to a single instance. So even if we had all nine machines, active and eight secondaries, we could only configure it to fail over between two of those. So if one went down, now we suddenly had no, no HA. We had no auto failover available. With SQL Server 2016, we're gonna be able to rep fail over automatically to any of our secondary copies. So as far as we know, that's gonna be three. Microsoft may increase that, we don't know. Like I mentioned, they're also gonna work on making the log transport faster. They're doing this through compression and through just streamlining the entire process. They're rewriting it yet again to make it even faster. Main reason for this, again, high workloads. They wanna be able to support every single workload possible on always on availability groups. Just like you guys wanna be able to support every single workload possible inside of VMs in SQL, with SQL Server. So, and then their, their main goal, match performance of a standalone server. That's their target. And they're getting really, really close to hitting it so far. In 2014, when it was introduced, reads for secondary servers went to a secondary server. So it was still a cool feature. We still got a little bit of scale out support. But what we get in SQL Server 2012, or sorry, 2016, is the ability to actually use round robin across all your secondary servers. So it looks sort of like this. Basically, you've got your web tier, or your application tier, and then you've got all your database servers at the bottom, kind of think of them as being behind a load balancer. All the traffic comes in, and it just gets routed to whichever one of those servers it needs to for read-only operations. 
So now suddenly we can support even bigger workloads in SQL Server while still giving ourselves high availability and disaster recovery. We can even do some cool things with DNS to, if we want to keep all the reads and writes within one local site. So we've got a lot of options available. Now one of the things I think is a really cool feature is this group managed service account support in SQL Server. This gives us more HA because when we change passwords today, we change service account passwords, we have to restart SQL Server. That requires an outage. With group managed service accounts, we no longer have to take an outage to restart our SQL Server instances. A lot of us probably have policies in, in place, you know, make corporate mandates to change passwords 30, 60, 90 days, and we have to go changing our service accounts passwords. This is obviously a royal pain to do because restarting servers and getting permission to restart systems on a regular basis is just annoying at best. Now, starting in Windows 2012, and actually supported in SQL Server 2014, we can use these group managed service accounts, which allows to create a domain user with a special parameter that's so that the Active Directory knows it's a group managed service account. We then tell Active Directory what machines are allowed to use this managed service account. When the first machine tries to use it, it sets the password. Every 30 days, it automatically changes the password, informs all the machines that are using the account of the new password. They all save the new password and does not require restarting any of the services that are running under that. So this worked in SQL Server 2014 on standalone instances. In SQL Server 2016, it's gonna be supported with our always on availability groups. So we can get that additional level of HA. So that's one less thing we have to restart our stuff with, restart our VMs with. So the configuration is fairly straightforward. I'll blow this up a little bit, make it easier to read. So we go into SQL Server Configuration Manager, and we simply change the startup account to be whatever our group managed service account is. So in this case, it's called GMSA1, and the way SQL Server and Windows know it's a managed service account is we put a dollar sign after it. Same thing we would do if we were trying to access a computer account. If we're doing it within the uh, Services Configuration Manager, it's gonna look just like that. Once we do that, we leave the password blank, click OK, restart SQL Server, and it'll start up using that new account. Uh, if you've got any Kerberos tokens or Kerberos tickets configurations enabled in Active Directory, obviously you'll need to reset all of those to use the new domain account so that things like Kerberos authentication keep working within your environment. So we've talked about how to keep the SQL Server up and running and why we need to do that. We've talked about the fact that DR is basically like buying insurance. We don't need disaster recovery until it fails. Then that is not a good time to try to figure out how to get HA and DR for SQL Server. And we've hopefully looked at some good options for you in SQL Server and how to get these things up and running and keep them up and running and do it in a fairly price acceptable way of doing things. Uh, do keep in mind, all the SQL Server always on availability group stuff I've talked about to date is Enterprise Edition. I cannot comment on what's coming in SQL Server 2016, but if you install it and run through the wizard, you'll see some things that I'm not allowed to talk about for some reason, because um, Microsoft has some very strange non-disclosure agreements. Um, but you can make some assumptions about what you see and what is going to be supported in the newer versions. Um, and then, of course, always have a plan as to what's going on inside SQL Server. So we've got a couple of minutes left if anybody has any questions. I know I talk about a lot of SQL Server stuff to a non-SQL Server audience. And I've got a couple of blank stares up front. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have any uh, comments on... Oh. Do you have any comments on HA for uh, SSRS? Uh, do I have any comments on high availability for SQL Server reporting services? Um, yes, yeah, so SQL Server reporting services it uses a scale-out mechanism. Um, so basically treat it like a web tier. Um, so just make it go wider, um, and then that will be kind of your HA environment for it. Perhaps um, the uh, load balancing on 2016 might help if you... Uh, uh, yeah, so you could area. put reporting services talking to a, a load balancer on always on availability groups, and then you could scale out that way on the back end. 
Um, I noticed that uh, you mentioned Azure a lot in there. Mm -hmm. Will this work on any public cloud? Yes, yeah, so all this works on every public cloud. You just have to do a little more work to get the networking stuff set up. Um, Microsoft has actually done a lot of stuff inside Management Studio to make it easier to spin up VMs in Azure from Management Studio. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously that, they're not going to do that tooling for like Amazon. Right. Um, but this will all work on any, on any cloud platform. Perfect. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. Run, microphone man, run. <laughs> Um, hi, um, I have, we have uh, a DR environment mm -hmm. uh, where we need to uh, occasionally do tests. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you solve that in, with your um, asynchronous availability group to DR? You need to stop the, the re replication yeah. to do the, so the DR test? DR testing gets tough when it comes to databases. Mm -hmm. um, there's not really an easy way to do it. Um, your best option is within, if you're using always on availability groups, you can actually pause data movement and then bring those databases online. Um, and then you can actually do reads, on, reads off of them. But you can't change anything. Right? Yeah, you're not going to be able to change any data. Um, the only way to do that would be probably to clone the VM and bring it up. Are you using Site Recovery Manager for everything else? We, we replicate through storage. Okay. And to a, a primary pool, then we do a snapshot where we do the so do your testing. Okay, so what you could uh, do is basically take a snapshot. So basically control all your SQL stuff outside of the rest of that. So you've, you've got everything else, and then you've got your, your annoying little SQL Server configuration. Um, and then as part of your SRM scripts that bring all that stuff online automatically, you could do a PowerShell script that would snapshot the SQL Server VM, mount that snapshot inside your bubble, inside your DR bubble, your test bubble, uh, and then it could then go in, because now it's talking only to the bubble domain controllers. Um, and now you could go into that SQL instance, bring those databases online, make them read writable, and then use them. And then when you're done, you just delete that snapshot. So that would be your best option for it. There's no integrated way of doing it, unfortunately. Just a, another question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the primary site with the availability groups, is there um, any degradation, performance degradation with uh, two-phase commit? Uh, so is there any performance the... degradation with two-phase commit? So Microsoft worked very hard to make sure the answer to that is almost no. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you're looking at an additional two to three milliseconds of latency from the time you in, to run the insert command to the time you get the response back saying it's committed. Um, and that's basically your network traffic and whatever time it takes to run the command over on that second machine. Um, so the, the commands do fire off at the same time. So it's not like you're running it once and then waiting for it to run a second time. They trigger at the same time, but there is a couple of milliseconds extra that you have to wait. Now, when you say the second uh, database is readable, mm -hmm. the application accesses uh, directly the, the, second, the, the second node, or uh, is the... The, the database that uh, commands where the, the read is done. It's, uh, uh, so there's, like there's, a... there's two ways to do it. You can either tell the application, go talk to this server, mm -hmm. uh, or you can put an additional parameter in the command line or the connection string of the application. Mm -hmm. um, that parameter is called application intent, and if you set the parameter to read only, it will then connect to the server, to the primary server, tell it, hey, I want a read only connection, and then the primary server will then redirect the connection automatically to a secondary. So basically, you'd have two connection strings in your application, one for read-write and one for read. So if it's a read-only command, like a select statement or a report, then it would use the second one. Okay. If it's something that changes data, it uses the first one. So it requires a little bit of code change to work, but it's not that painful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So unfortunately, I believe we are all out of time. Um, come up to me and we'll talk. Thank you all very much for coming. I do appreciate it. Don't forget to fill out the survey so that uh, you can win a prize.